purposely. Your life, God's purpose. Listen at onpurposely.com. Welcome to the bonfire. It's great to be together again. I always look forward to this time every week, and I hope you do too. Please share it with friends and family. As we gather, the community's growing. We're growing in our faith. God is transforming our lives, and everyone is welcome. You might be someone who's gone to church a long time, and you need some encouragement. If you're honest, maybe the fire started to fade, and at the bonfire, God ignites. God revitalizes our life, our spiritual lives. Or maybe you're new, and like me growing up, Everything is new with faith, and you don't even have a Bible. You don't read the Bible. You're just starting to learn about God. You're welcome here. This is a place where we want to create. We can go honest, get deep. Uh, We can talk about life, be real. But the most important thing is God's presence. That's what I believe is true about life every day, not just one day, one hour, one place. God's presence. God is love. God is light. God is a consuming fire. And in this season— And in this particular episode, we're going to focus on the hope of Jesus that leads to revival. The hope of Jesus that leads to revival. And that's a prayer. Revive us, God. Sometimes we're worn out. Sometimes we're discouraged. Sometimes we lose that fire. We lose motivation. Sometimes we feel lonely. Sometimes we feel like there's just so much happening in the world that it's overwhelming or it's disappointing. It's confusing. And this is a place where we can be still and know that he is God. This is a place that we draw near to God and he draws near to us. This is a place where we receive the hope of God and we're built up. And we need that because hope on the inside, it's going to flow into every part of our lives. The inner life, your inner life, your inner story is the most important story of your life. Today, we're going to look at someone who really experiences the hope of God and it leads to revival. His name is Philip. There are several Philips in the Bible. And the one we're going to focus on is in the book of Acts. Chapters, as you're going through chapter 6, 7, 8, you keep reading about Philip and you see his story. We're going to connect the dots, fill in the blanks. I think, and a lot of Bible scholars would say that Philip is probably one of the 72 that Jesus sends out in Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends out this group of people and they're sent out in twos and they're sent out with a reliance on God. They don't have everything amazing with them. They don't know what's going to happen. There's uncertainty. There's unknown. They don't have their comfort zone. But what they have is God's presence, the love of God to love people, courage, and they have unity. And that'll take you so far in life. When you know you're doing what God's asked you to do, And you are in that position, aligned with heaven. You're being led by God. You're doing it with other people that share the same purpose and passion. And you're desiring to see people healed and restored. And you're desiring to see people have shalom and the peace of God. God's going to use you in amazing ways. Because it's not as much about your ability. It's more about your availability. And these 72 say yes to God. And God starts to move. Now, when we get to the book of Acts, what we see is there's a problem. A lot of times, God shows up when there's a problem and God brings a solution. God makes some shifts and adjustments. Have you noticed that theme in your life? There's a problem. It feels daunting. feels frustrating. And then you seek God and God starts to raise up some people, shift some roles. God brings direction. Don't be discouraged when there's a problem. You can pause and you can know that God has a solution. God is with us. Let's seek God. God gives wisdom to anyone who asks. God is generous with wisdom. And that's exactly what happens in the book of Acts. Now, it's referred to as, you know, the first deacons. And deacon means someone serving. And what's happening overall is there are Greek widows who are being overlooked in terms of food distribution. They had a challenge because they needed to raise up more people. These Greek widows that were hungry, that were overlooked, someone needed to care for them. So they raised up seven people who would focus on the food and the distribution and waiting on tables. At the same time, others focused on the word and prayer. Different people had different lanes. You have a lane. You have a purpose. Run your race for the Lord in your lane with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as you do it. One of the people, the seven, who were raised up, Philip. We read Philip here, and we know he's servant-hearted. He cares. He wants to make sure that everyone has enough food. He cares for widows. Do you know the Bible says pure faith and pure religion is to care for widows, care for orphans? 
And as we care for those in need, God is glorified. This is the clear work of God. We want to be involved in this. Philip has a heart to serve. He wants to make sure with compassion that there's provision. When you have compassion in your heart, you're going to provide for people. And he serves faithfully in that capacity in Acts chapter 6. And it's incredible because not only are the people fed, but then also the word of God is spreading around Jerusalem. And what happens as God is changing lives? Persecution. Persecution comes when people are living for God. The Bible says anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When opposition comes, that's historically when the church has come alive. Sometimes in America, I wonder if we're a little sleepy because there hasn't been much opposition. Now opposition is increasing. And I think it's going to wake up some people. I think those who have been sleepy are starting to see what's happening. They're understanding the times. They're seeing it played out between good and evil, light and darkness, God and the devil. They're seeing all these things played out now. And that gets our attention. As the persecution increases, now Christians are being killed. And there's some important decisions to make. You need to know your deep convictions. You need to know what mountains you're going to die on. You need to know what's most important in life so you can invest your time and energy, your finances. You need to know why you're here and how God's called you to make this world a better place. The Christians know that if they continue to follow Jesus, they might be killed. They don't slow down. Catch that. They don't slow down. In fact, other people are noticing that they have courage. They are ordinary people who have been with Jesus and they have courage. They don't shrink back. It doesn't matter if one of them is killed. The other ones get bolder. They care for each other. They provide food. They provide clothes. They provide money. They send it from church to church. They are alive. This is what you recognize in the book of Acts, that the Christians are willing to die for their faith. They are committed to telling everyone about Jesus. They fill Jerusalem with the gospel. They make sure everyone in Jerusalem has an opportunity, every man, woman, and child, to hear about Jesus. And they love each other. They are united. Do they have conflict? Yes. Do they work through the conflict? Yes. Are they perfect? No. Do they have a lot of issues? Yes. Does every church have challenges and issues? Yes. This is what they're committed to, though. They're devoted to scripture, prayer, loving each other, sharing the word. They are committed to bringing the good news of Jesus to everywhere. Where they live, work, learn, or play, everyone's going to hear about Jesus. That's their commitment, their deep conviction. Are they willing to die on that mountain? Absolutely. And many of them are. Stephen is killed. Persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. And now they're scattered and they go to different places. Philip is filled with the hope of God. The hope of God is greater than our challenges. He is grieving, but he has hope. And the hope is greater than the grieving in the morning. He's going to lose loved ones. He's going to lose brothers. He's going to lose sisters. A lot's going to be lost. He's going to be traveling. He's going to lose his comfort zone. There's a lot of things that are lost. There's a lot of grieving in the book of Acts. And yet, there's a hope that's greater. When you put your hope in Jesus, when you receive the hope of Jesus, it doesn't mean your life's going to get easier. It might be more difficult. There might be more challenges. There might be more hardships. God doesn't promise us a simple, easy path where we have immunity from the difficulties in this world. No, the Bible says when you face trials of various kinds. In other words, you will face trials of various kinds. But persevere. It'll be used by God to develop your faith, that you'll be mature, not lacking in anything. Continue to trust God when your situation gets difficult. Philip goes to Samaria. And if you know anything about this cultural context, Samaria is seen as second rate, seen as half-bred. What does that mean? It's a mixture of Jew and Gentile. The Jews look down upon the Samaritans because they're not 100% Jewish. And yet, the Gentiles know Samaritans. They're half Jewish and half Gentile. Samaritans are often ignored. They're treated as second class, sadly. Jesus broke that norm, went to the woman at the well, who is a Samaritan, who had been married many times, brought her living water for her soul. She tasted. She could see the Lord is good. Jesus is the Messiah. She experienced salvation. And then she went around her community and told everyone the good news. Here's the Messiah. Here's the Savior. Samaritans, God loves them. 
God loves people from every nation, tongue, and tribe. God is saving the Samaritans, and here he's going to use Philip. There's a revival in Samaria. Philip goes to an unlikely place, a place that a lot of people want to skip over, and God brings revival. Revival doesn't happen when there's smooth sailing and everything's easy. Revival comes when there's a lot of challenges. Revival comes to unlikely people and places. In John chapter 3, Jesus says, the wind of the Holy Spirit blows. You see the effects of the wind, but you can't control the wind. You can't stop the wind. And you don't even know where the wind is going to blow next. The Spirit is moving in Samaria. Philip's preaching. People are getting saved. People are getting healed. There's miracles in Samaria. There's a revival in Samaria. Samaria, a place that's felt hopeless, is now filled with the hope of Jesus. And here's Philip again. The hope of God helps him to serve the widows. Now the hope of God, and he's filled with the Spirit of God, he's going to bring the good news of God. And Samaritans are going to be transformed by the hope of Jesus. Revival is happening with the Samaritans. It's the same Philip. And as this revival breaks out, you might think Philip should stay there. But God moves him. There's going to be times in your life where God is moving in amazing ways and yet he tells you to move on, to transfer, to shift. You need to listen to God and trust God in those moments. God will raise up more people for the Samaritans. There's going to be other times in your life where it's difficult and you want to move, you want to change, and God says, no, I haven't released you. You need to stay here. Philip, with the hope of God in his heart and soul, He's listening and trusting God, and God is going to move him. And when you get to Acts chapter 8, there's an Ethiopian. And Philip is going to hear God's direction and voice. I encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Be someone who's sensitive to the Holy Spirit, tuned in to the Holy Spirit, that you recognize God's leadership and direction. If you don't want to hear the Holy Spirit, your mind and heart are aren't tuned in, you're just going to do what everyone else is doing in the world. You're going to follow the patterns of the world. Or you're just going to do what you want to do. Or you're just going to call the shots and you're just hoping God blesses it. When you're filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit, God's already in that. His presence is with you. And as Philip is taking these faith steps to serve the widows, to go to the Samaritans, and now to, on this road, find an Ethiopian. Isn't it just like God to direct him to lead this big, leave this big group and go find one person, an Ethiopian? God's going to show you, here's the one person I want you to talk to. Here's the one person I want you to focus on. Here's the one person I want you to come alongside and hear their story and hear their questions and get to know them. And then I'm going to use you to love them, serve them, share with them. That's what happens to Philip. And in Acts chapter 8, as you read about Philip and the Ethiopian. This Ethiopian is a eunuch and part of Candace's team. Candace, she's queen, and he has a high position in Ethiopia. He's an influential person. But at the same time, he reads the Bible. He opens it up. He's reading Isaiah chapter 53. This is what he reads. And this describes Jesus. Isaiah 53 is a prophecy of Jesus in the Old Testament. Also, some people say the Hebrew Bible. There are descriptions of Jesus. Why? Because God gives clues. God gives clarity. God gives prophecy. He doesn't want anyone to miss the Messiah. If you're Jewish and you're watching or listening, read Isaiah chapter 53 and you're going to see God's Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He's described perfectly. This is what the Ethiopian reads. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. As you continue in that chapter, you're going to see Jesus is the suffering servant. Literally, by his wounds we are healed. It was because of his sacrifice that our transgressions and iniquities, all of our sin is forgiven. And what a transfer, what an exchange. This is the grace of God. The Ethiopians reading about this and not everything's clear. Now, this is where Philip, led by God, is right alongside of the Ethiopian.
For generations, children and families in the poorest places in the world have struggled to find clean water, food, and a chance for a brighter future. But all that can change in this generation. You can be part of the solution. Go to worldconcern.org. As you participate, this is what will happen. Villages will be transformed far beyond where the road ends, and children and families will receive the love of Christ. You can make a difference. Go to worldconcern.org. Let's be part of the solution together. As the conversation develops, the Ethiopian is going to put his trust in Jesus. He's going to receive the hope of God. Now they're going by some water. He says, can anything prevent me from getting baptized right now? And what a joy, baptism. We have baptisms all the time in our church. It's one of the highlights of the year. Every time someone gets baptized, they share their story. They publicly say, I'm following Jesus. It's amazing. And that's what happens here. Not only does this Ethiopian eunuch get baptized, now he's going to go back and he's going to start to share more And the gospel of Jesus Christ spreads to Ethiopia, to Africa. Philip is considered that first missionary. He's an evangelist. He's a deacon. He serves. He's using all his gifts for Jesus. Are you using all your gifts? Are you reaching people locally and globally? Are you coming alongside of individuals, friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, co-workers that God has brought into your life? Are you bringing the hope of God? I believe the church should be the most hope-filled place in a city. More than the bar, the games, the restaurants, people who are looking for hope would come to church. There would be revival. There's revival with the widows. There's revival for the Samaritans. There's revival with the Ethiopian eunuch and revival will spread to Africa. It's amazing what's happening. Obedience, blessings. Obedience, revival. Hope received, hope given, hope multiplied, exponential hope, infinite hope. All this is taking place. Read through these chapters. Acts chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. Watch how God is moving because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way he brings hope then is the way he brings hope today. And we desperately need hope. We need revival in Auburn where I serve. We need revival across Seattle in the sound. We need revival in our nation. We need revival in our homes. We need revival in our hearts. What's revival? Revival is more of God's presence. How does that work? Theologically, God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. At the same time, God is in some places more than others. That's a simple way of saying it. For example, every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit inside of them. And yet God also says, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled, Ephesians 5, 18. How does that happen? You surrender. You confess your sins. You ask to be filled. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Your body is the temple. God wants to fill the temple with his presence. Some people have more of the Spirit. Some people have less. And it just comes down to this. It's not your education or your money. Are you hungry? Are you teachable? Are you surrendered? Confess your sins. Ask to be filled. And God is going to fill you with his presence. Revival is what we need. More of God's presence. When revival comes, people who have been sleepy spiritually, they wake up. They come alive. When there's revival, people who have been at church and are not born again, they get saved. When there's revival, people out in the community who have rejected God, they come to know Jesus. They have a relationship with God that starts. When revival happens, it's powerful. And revival comes from God. It can't be faked, manufactured, manipulated. A lot of people do that. No one wants that. It's got to be from God. And yet, God invites us and we participate. We have revival nights at our church. It's exciting. We don't know what God's going to do. We gather to pray and worship and turn from sin. And some people get baptized. Revival nights, catalytic, it's a spark. One of the great things that happens in revival nights is people start to see the potential. What if we live this way all the time? What if we're praying together? What if we're praising God? What if we're making ourselves, and this is what worship is, available to God? We're offering ourselves to God. Here am I, send me. When people start doing that, God's presence shows up and neighborhoods are transformed. The environment at home is transformed. And as God transforms where we live, now the spiritual temperature changes. 
Because listen, if we don't have revival and God's hope in our hearts, we won't have it in our homes. If we don't have it in our homes, we won't have it in our church. It starts in the heart. It moves to the homes. It goes to the church. And now it's in the streets, the hope of God. It starts to pour out into the community. And now you can't try to keep it in a box. It's so much bigger than the four walls of the church. As you read through the book of Acts, the hope of God is spreading. There's thousands in one day putting their trust in Jesus. I know that's happening. It's happening online. People are spiritually seeking. They're starving. They're searching. And what happens? They hear about Jesus. They watch videos. They look at websites. They make decisions. From that, relationships start. There's a connection. Someone disciples them. It's not about decisions, disciples. They get connected in the local church. They get connected in a Bible study. They start to serve. They start to lead other people to Jesus. Revival's happening and it's connecting one person at a time, like the book of Acts, chapter 8, Philip, the Ethiopian. Uh, revival's also happening as the gospel's going out now online. We had a campaign, 480,000 people put their trust in Jesus. There's so many digital ministries that are sharing the gospel. In Matthew 24, it says the good news will go out to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. That's what God's doing. It's on the ground. It's person to person. It's in local churches, but it's also in homes. It's digitally happening online. God is active in all of this. Is there the devil that's real? Yes, there is. Demons that are real? Yes, there are. People that are real that are against Christ? Yes, there are. Are there nations where you might be killed if you follow Jesus? Yes, that's happening today. Pray for places like Ukraine. Pray for Nigeria and all of the persecution that's happening there. Pray for Pakistan. I could continue to name countries, tell you stories, where just like in the book of Acts, there's intense persecution right now. It's almost as if in the book of Acts, the glory of God is increasing and the opposition is increasing. In America right now, I think the opposition is increasing to Jesus. And at the same time, God's power is greater in some places than we've ever seen before. We saw in California record numbers of baptisms recently. We're seeing on college campuses people coming to know Jesus. Jesus Revolution movie, God used that in mighty ways. There's revival nights that are happening in churches. There is a percolation right now, if that's a word. Things are percolating. And God is starting to build up. This is what I'm, I'm saying. There are some churches that are drifting from the Bible. There are some churches that are drifting from Jesus. Some, some churches that are drifting from the hope of God. And as they drift, they're slowly dying. And then there's going to be other churches that are all about God's presence and God's word. And they're all about living for God, even though the culture feels more like Babylon, like Daniel. They're going to live for God. And the light is getting brighter. The darkness is getting darker. The temperature is changing. The environment's changing. Understand the times. Know the times we're living in. Just like Philip, be ready to serve the widows. Be ready to reach people who are not being reached, like the Samaritans. Be ready to one-on-one -on -one talk to someone from a different culture, a different nation. Build them up, equip them, baptize them, like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And revival is something that's going to continue to grow because God's kingdom is unstoppable. The big picture, we know this, God has an eternal kingdom and no one, not even the gates of hell, can prevail against it. You know how the story ends because you know how the Bible ends. It's not a mystery in one sense. There's a lot of clarity. It couldn't end any better. At the same time, there is some mystery. When exactly will Christ return? We don't know. But our eyes are on Jesus and we're trusting him. I believe it's time for revival. I believe it's time to answer the call. It's time to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's time to trust Jesus. It's time to break some of the negative thinking patterns, the patterns that have been in our families, even some of the dead traditions in churches. It's time for new wine that doesn't fit in old wineskins. God is doing something new. Do you not perceive it? And for such a time as this, God is raising people up. Elijah was in a cave and he looked out. He felt discouraged. He felt alone. God said, I'm raising up 7,000. I believe God is raising up thousands across the land. I believe 
It's time for revival. Revival is more of God's presence. Revival happens when we turn from our sins. 2 Chronicles 7.14, we humble ourselves. We seek God's face. We turn from our wicked ways. We cry out to God. And God hears from heaven, forgives our sin, and heals our land. We need healing in America. And I believe these are personal decisions. These are daily decisions. Revival is saying yes to God without any disclaimers and excuses. No more excuses. We have so many excuses. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. You're right. It's revival. Well, I don't know if I'm going to like it. Trust God is good. Well, I don't know who else wants revival. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of people that do. Don't keep your eyes on everyone else. Well, I've never experienced that before. That's okay. God does new things. Well, I'm not sure I want to get into the word. Yes, this is your spiritual food. Well, I don't know how to pray. That's okay. There's people who are going to pray with you. The Holy Spirit's going to help you. Well, I don't know about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. The Trinity is not Father, Son, and the Holy Scripture. You have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. All these things are part of revival. And when revival comes, everything that God is normally doing is multiplied, accelerated. God convicts us of our sin. God gives us courage and boldness. God helps us to make disciples. We share the gospel. We start to serve other people with our gifts. All these things that God is doing in our lives, revival accelerates it and multiplies it. That's why we need revival. I want to pray right now, and I don't know where you're at spiritually. So I want to pray a few different prayers, and you say yes to the prayer that really fits for you. God, I pray for the people who don't know you, Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and they would put their trust in you right now, start the relationship with you right now, that you are their Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for our sins and that you're risen. We worship you, Jesus. God, I pray for the people who are watching you that know you and have drifted, have misplaced hope, lost hope. I pray that you would fill them with your hope. Fill them with your spirit today. Give them fresh vision and purpose. God, we pray right now for our churches and our cities, for revival. God, we pray for you to move in power. We don't want anything to do with timidity, but your power, your love. God, I pray we'd see revival in America. It would really start in our hearts, start in our homes. And we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a final challenge. It's been said you draw a circle, a circle where you stand. And in that circle, you're there. Don't leave that circle until God revives you. Pray that God would revive you. Turn from your sins. Draw near to God. Ask to be filled with the Spirit. When you sense God's presence, you're filled with hope. Then yes, step out of that circle. Invite others in to the revival. And when you start to get discouraged, come back to that circle. Ask God to fill you with his presence, forgive your sins. Ask God to lead and guide you. And again, God is bringing revival. It's not man-made, it could never be. But it's from God, it's a gift, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And just like Philip in the Bible, in the book of Acts, God wants to revive his people because God wants to bring revival to the land. It's a fire, it's the bonfire. It's why we have this podcast. Thank you so much for taking time today. If you can share this with a friend, let's spread the love of Jesus, the word of God. For such a time as this, God is doing amazing work for his glory and our good. It's the bonfire.